This is Torrent Talks, and today I'm going to be talking about Marco Polo Season 1, Episode 1, The Wayfarer. So the story of Marco Polo takes place during the reign of Kublai Khan, who is the grandson of the great warrior Genghis Khan. And he has amassed a huge empire, the biggest the world has ever seen at that point, save for this one little tiny holdout, the walled city controlled by the Song Dynasty of Shenyang. How the Polo family gets involved is that they are a family of merchants, consisted of Marco Polo, his father, and his uncle. And they are trying to do business along the Silk Road so they have to travel to the Khan to get his permission to be able to trade and do their little merchant thing along the Silk Road. The opening sequence of Marco Polo is done very beautifully. It's done in the ink and brush style. And it came about using Sumi ink on dense paper. The opening montage is supposed to make you think of the themes of Marco Polo such as yin and yang, journey, discovery, power, murder, and it's supposed to get you immersed in the world of Marco Polo as you're seeing things through his eyes. And so the story kicks off with the Polo family traveling to the con. Their entourage is murdered and they are ushered in by some of the con's guards and they are brought before the Khan because they were supposed to bring priests to the Khan and they don't have any priests for it. So they come before the Khan and the Khan says, you came all this way, but you didn't bring me what I asked for. You traveled through the mountains and the desert and I want you to describe for me my desert. It is a most barren region, sire. No, no water, no life, Lord Khan. Not, not even a bird. No, not even a bird. It is great country. A sea of death. Yes, very much alive. At night you hear it. The shifting sands, they sing. Continue. Voices like spirits trying to blow you of course this is why men die out there and the con was semi impressed with marco and his ability to describe things in a beautiful and interesting way while also being very descriptive but it still doesn't negate the fact that they didn't bring him the priest he asked for so he's like you know what polo family you had one job and you pretty much failed so guess what you're banished forever and Marco's father, not wanting to lose the trade route, he offers up Marco as a manservant to the Khan to be in the service of his court. And he is taken away as a prisoner of the Khan. So now he is in the Khan's court. The show then flashes back three years to when Marco and his father meet for the first time. And Marco, not wanting to be left alone again because his mom's dead and everything, so he sneaks on the ship. Once it's out to sea, they discover him. And by that point, they really can't do anything because they're already out to sea. So Marco gets his way. But Dad's not happy, but yeah, what can he do? Then it travels along with the Polo family as they go on their journey to get to the con. They have the priest with them at first, but they start getting skittish and want to go back home. And Marco's like, oh, it's fine. Go back home. And the dad and his uncle are just kind of like, oh, what the fuck, bro? You can't just, you can't do that. You can't just tell the priest to leave. Like, you don't know our business. And so later Marco gets ill and his uncle's like, we don't have time for this. He already slowing us down. We need to just leave him. And the dad's like, no, shut up. Like, he's my son. Like, I'm not just going to leave him here to die. Then we are taken back to the present day where Marco is a prisoner of the Khan. Meanwhile, Khan has amassed his entire council to come together to figure out what they are going to do about the walled city of Shenyang. So his advisors and other people in the war council, along with the Khan's brother, Eric, believe that this city is being defiant and the Khan is becoming too Chinese in his ways. He is not staying true to the Mongol 
way of doing things. Emperor of China, Emperor of Mongolia, I will be Emperor of the world. And so they decide to attack this little fishing village of Wu. They decide to attack this little very close to Zhang Yang, but they can't get in there because like I said, it's a walled city. Then we are taken to the walled city of Zhang Yang and we see that the Emperor of the Song Dynasty is dying. He is on his deathbed and he is being comforted by his empress. And then his chancellor, Zhao Sadao, comes in and he tries to reassure the empress that he is doing everything he can about the Mongols who want to come in and attack them. But in reality, he is just biding his time until the emperor dies so he can be in total control. And so he's talking to one of his advisors about how once the emperor dies, he will be in full control and he'll be able to take care of this problem. And everyone's going to listen to him, including his sister, who is the royal concubine, which is like the official mistress. He's essentially pimped out his sister to take care of some diplomat, you know, between the sheets, so he can get whatever he wants out of this guy. So we are then taken to Mei Lin, his sister, and she's kind of working her own little game on this guy. And she has her own plans of, you know how to use her womanly, womanly weapons. <laughs> Marco is then taken to meet a blind warrior named Hundred Eyes, and Hundred Eyes essentially tells him that he has been commissioned to train Marco and get him acclimated to the comms court. And that if he doesn't, it will be his head on the chopping block, so he tells Marco, like, you better get it, get it together, and get it together fast. Good. We begin with roots. You have been conscripted into the court of Kublai Khan. For what, I do not know. I am Hundred Eyes. I am kept here to train the Khan's sons, his nobles, his pets. He tells Marco that he admires his spirit, his fiery little, you know, Latin spirit, but if he doesn't learn to temper that, he will not survive. So he is taken to learn calligraphy, archery, hawking, riding, and everything else he will need to know to survive in Kublai's court. Later, Marco is summoned to the Khan. The Khan wants to know the progress and status of his teachings and going on. And then he asked Marco to describe a certain path that he and his father traveled through to get to the Khan. And Marco at this point is still bummed out about being there and having to stay and being a prisoner or whatnot. And he describes what the Khan wants to hear, but in the most basic of terms. And the Khan is like getting angry because he is not going to have this defiance. So he tells the guards to go take him outside and put some shit in his mouth till he learns, you know, some respect. And he's like, okay, wait, no, don't, don't do that. And he starts describing things in the way the Khan wants to hear. And the Khan essentially tells him he's going to pair him up with a tax collector to go into the Imperial City. And he wants Marco to report back what he sees in his descriptive way that he sees it. Meanwhile, Jingum and the rest of the Khanate warriors are gone off to the city of Wuchen, which is not a little village. It is a kind of military outpost. And the soldiers of Zhang Yang are there and armed and ready to go, ready to rumble. Do you hear them taunt us? They mock our blood. Even without Arik's army, we should still attack like Mongols or retreat as cowards. The Khan brother Eric with his troops are nowhere to be found, so they have essentially been abandoned and left to get murdered. Jingum has to make a decision whether the army is going to retreat like cowards, which Mongols do not do, or they're going to attack even though they're outnumbered, which means they're essentially going off to their death. People already think he's weak because he's half Chinese, and so he does the only logical thing that he can do, and that is attack even though the outcome might not be, it's not looking good for, to come out in their favor. But he does it anyway, so the army attacks, even though they're outnumbered. For the first episode, I thought it was okay. I really like the world, and I'm interested to see where it goes. And I think 
that when people compare Marco Polo to Game of Thrones, that's inaccurate. In Game of Thrones, I feel like the stakes are raised so high because anyone can die at any time. So it really ups the ante as far as the drama and the storyline is concerned. And also, Game of Thrones has this massive epicness, fantasy realm, like world building aspect to it, which Marco Polo doesn't have, at least not yet, or as I have seen so far. I feel like it's a good starting point, and I'm excited to see where some of the characters progress and develop from here. And I am looking forward to reviewing episode number two. When I first heard about Marco Polo, I was like, oh, okay, I know the story. Like, you know, Marco Polo, character on Uncharted 2, <laughs> um, dumbass pool game. Uh, yeah, so. But it's, it's pretty good. So we'll just see what happens. And Maylin, I'm super excited to see what she's gonna have going on. She's 